Amen. So Abraham, Abraham had many sons. Many sons had fathers. All right, Linda, if you go talk the whole time, I'm going to quit. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So Abraham, uh, Abraham, Genesis chapter 15. This is my, this is my favorite chapter. It's my, my favorite chapter of Genesis. Um, it has so much meaning, so much depth. Um, it, it's just, uh, it, it's amazing, really. Uh, and so as we get into chapter 15, we uh, remember the context, of course, that we were in chapter 14. Uh, what were we looking at last week? What happened to Abraham? Don't all speak at once. What did he do? Rescued Lot. Yeah, rescued Lot. There were, remember, four regional kings that came and just conquered through the land. And they were pillaging and, and, and taking prisoners and taking uh, bounty from the cities that they conquered. Uh, remember the five kings of cities that were in the land rebelled against them. And they just came down and they conquered the whole land. Uh, and they picked up Lot, who was in Sodom. We talked about that last week, uh, that he was in Sodom. And they uh, uh, took him prisoner, presumably his family too, although that's not said in chapter 14. Uh, and then they were taking him up north, uh, presumably back to Persia or, or wherever they were going. And Abraham got word and he took off after him and he went and rescued Lot and he went and brought him back. And we saw the interaction that he had with uh, Melchizedek, who was king and priest over Salem and the king of Sodom, who was king of Sodom. Uh, and so we saw that uh, Abraham honored Melchizedek, who was a uh, priest and king of God Most High uh, in a pagan land, no less. And he didn't dishonor, but he separated himself from the king of Sodom. And the king of Sodom wanted to give him all the, all the money, all the bounty, and as long as Abraham give him, gave him the people back of his city. And Abraham said, I've, I've lifted my hand to the Lord that I will not take not even a strap uh, of your, uh, or sandal strap from you, uh, that lest that you say that the king of Sodom has made me rich. And we talked about that, about how Abraham is, or I keep calling him Abraham, it's Abram. You just know that I mean Abram. He's going to, name's going to change here in a little bit. But uh, Abram is growing in the school of faith. He's growing in the school of faith. He's had some ups and he's had some downs. He's, he's failed miserably as he went to Egypt and lied and told people his wife was his sister and all of that happened and he didn't, didn't trust the God's promise, so he tried to figure out a way to get it on his own. And then, then we come to chapter 14, and we see he does, he does great. You know, he, 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 did, he did wonderful in trusting God's promise and not taking anything from the world and those kind of things. Well, you can imagine on the, on the, back, of, uh, uh, on the back of that victory, um, Abraham is probably, you would think, feeling pretty good. In this chapter, in chapter 15, verses 1 through 6 are going to be God reaffirming His promise to Abraham. And verses 7 through 21, the rest of the chapter, we're going to do the whole chapter tonight, uh, is going to be God making a covenant with Abraham. And the covenant with Abraham that He makes is so important, and it's so magnificent, and it's so gospel-centered. The New Testament authors use this covenant with Abraham to talk about our life in Christ over and over and over and over again in the New Testament. So you would think that Abraham is riding pretty high right now. He's come off a good victory. He's beaten these other armies and he's doing, doing really good. He's succeeded in trusting God rather than trusting the Word. But the first thing that God says to him after these things in verse 1, the Word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and he says, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your reward reward shall be very great. Some of your translations may say, I am your great reward. Uh, that's a valid translation as well. So why would he be afraid after he just had this victory, this great victory over all these armies, this trusting God and separating himself from the king of, uh, of Sodom? Why would, he, why would he be afraid now, do you think? Remember what just happened? He just beat five regional kings, big kings, big armies. Just went and beat them. He just basically, I don't want to say he spit in his face, but he, he probably made the king of Sodom pretty mad, I would imagine, uh, by not joining himself with him. Uh, so 
Abram's probably got a host of new enemies now. Not to mention the fact that, you know, let's just be honest, the promised land hadn't really been too promising to Abraham so far, or Abram so far. You know, it's been lacking resources. He and Lot had to split because there weren't enough resources. It's besieged by armies. Uh, when he first got there, there was a famine and he had to go to Egypt. Uh, and so you can imagine what kind of mindset Abraham is probably in. And that's why God comes to him in a vision and reassures him. He says, I am your shield. I am your shield, meaning, of course, you know, that's a good word picture. I am your protection. I'm your protection against all your enemies. You know, you just made all these kings really, really mad by going and defeating them with 318 guys. Uh, I'm going to be your I'm going to be your protection. Uh, I'm going to be your reward. Uh, he says uh, your reward is going to be very great because of me, God says. Abram just gave up all this money, right? He just gave up all this, the spoils of war. He gave up everything that he fought and, and received from uh, uh, the armies that they had took from all these cities. He gave up all these things and God comes to him and says, you don't, you don't need to be afraid. He says, I am your shield. I'm going to be the one that protects you. I am going to be your reward. Your reward is very great. And when he says this to Abram, the reason why I say Abram's feeling kind of bad is because in the next verse... Abram says something that just kind of sounds like he's wavering a little bit. He said, it says, but Abram said, when God said, I am your shield, I am your great reward. Abram says, oh, Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, Abram said, dead gum, and I did it again. Behold, you have given me no offspring and a member of my household will be my heir. So he's wavering a little bit, isn't he? Anybody know how long he's been in the promised land about now? About when we come to chapter 15? How old was Abraham when he was called to the promised land? You know, it was told us. No, he was, about, he was 75. He's going to be 99 when he has Isaac. He's 75 when he came into the promised land. He's been in the promised land about 10 years now. He's about 85. It's still about, you know, 15, 18 years before he actually has Isaac at 99 years old. Um, and so he's been there a long time. 10 years is a long time. That's a long time. And you still haven't received the promise that you've been given. God told him, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And through you and your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Um, Abram has gone through a lot. You know, we've talked about famine and we talked about going to Egypt and all that that happened there. Talked about um, the war that happened in the land as the armies came down. Um, he's promised to be a, a, a great nation. But, you know, all this has happened and here he's sitting after all this time and he still doesn't have an heir still doesn't have a son still no closer to seeing the promise fulfilled than when he first got to the promised land and this is one of those things you know i don't have to explain it to you guys the older he gets the less likely it's going to happen you know what i mean the less likely he's going to have the longer we wait god the longer, you know, the harder it is for an old guy to have a kid. I'm not going to say nothing else. I'm not going no further than that. But if I have no offspring, if I have no child, I have no land. You promised me the land too, but how am I going to have the land? I'm going to die and I'm not going to have anybody from my family that's going to take the land. Um, and in verse 3, I might be reading a little too much into the text, but to me, it, it almost sounds like, He's blaming God a little bit or not. He's not just coming out and saying, you know, it's your fault, whatever. But he says he's not saying, oh, I don't have a child in the first in verse two. He says, I continue childless and woe is me. Verse three says, behold, you have given me no offspring. You have given me no offspring. And so Abram is asking, what will you give me? What will you give me? The, the, uh, the point is, he's going to ask for a sign in a minute, but the point is, what do you mean you're, gonna, you, you're, you're my shield and you're my great reward? What, what are you going to give me? I don't have any kids. I don't have any heir. I don't have anybody to take any of this. You know, if you give me the land today, I'm going to die. And Eliezer of Damascus is going to take everything that, that you've given me. So you're not giving me any reward. I mean, he's not saying that, but that's what that's what the, the tone of it sounds like. Behold, you've given me no offspring and a member of my household will be my heir. So he is he sounds to me frustrated. He sounds worried. Uh, it's hard to trust God when you're on God's timing. 
You know, God promised him, you're going to have an heir. You're going to have the land. You're going to be a blessing to the whole world. God made these and they're firm promises. And we know that they're true and that they are going to happen. But, you know, 10 years and they ain't happened yet. You know, come to find out, you know, if we fast forward, it's going to be a lot more years before they actually do happen, before Isaac is actually born. Um, it's hard to trust God when you're waiting, when you're just waiting on the promise, waiting on the promise to be fulfilled. You know, I know you said this, but, you know, in my, in my fallibility, in my heart, it's hard to it's hard to keep it's hard to keep trusting. And so if it was me, if I was God. I would probably zap Abraham right here or Abram right here and destroy him for being disrespectful. But that's not what God does. God shows him grace. He says, you have given me no offspring. Uh, what are you going to do to give me a reward? The uh, heir, in, uh, I'm not going to have an heir. I'm, Eliezer is going to take all my stuff when I die. So you're not going to give me no reward. But God says to him in verse four, behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This is the word of the Lord, meaning this is what God says. God's promise. He says, this man shall not be your heir. Eliezer of Damascus shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir, meaning he will come from your body. Your, your heir, your son will be your heir. And he brought him outside. And this is where God expands the promise. He says, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Now, I want you to notice how gentle God is with Abram. I mean, after he says, you've given me no child, you know, what are you going to do? How are you going to be my shield, my reward? Uh, God is pretty gentle with the frustrated Abraham. Um, and he just basically reaffirms the promise. He said, yes, I am going to give you a son. I am going to give you an heir. He's going to come from your own body. And he gives him this new picture, this new illustration to show him uh, uh, more fully that he is going to make him a great nation. He says, look toward the heaven the num uh, and number the stars if you're able to num number them. He says, so shall your offspring be. Not only am I going to give you an heir, I'm going to give you offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky. Have you ever tried to walk outside and count the stars? Yeah, you get lost real easy. You know, before there was before there was modern science or whatever, I always get the names mixed up, so I may have this wrong. Don't quote me on this, but one of the guys, either Copernicus or Galileo, went and counted the stars the best he could, and he came up with three or four thousand uh, and then another one years, years later came. He came up with 30 something thousand. Well, well, just looking in the sky and counting. Well, now we know there's there's millions upon millions upon millions upon millions. You know, it's it's like God said, the sand of the seashore, your offspring will be. Uh, they'll be uncountable. And so God reaffirms this promise to Abram. Abram comes. Uh, God comes to Abram and he knows Abram's heart. He knows that Abram has just made a whole lot of enemies in the promised land. Uh, and he knows that Abram's heart is wavering a little bit. So he comes and he says, don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield. I'm your great reward. And Abram kind of lets loose a little bit and says, what are you going to give me? He says, I don't have no heir. I don't have anybody to take to take anything that you do give me. Uh, this guy's going to take all my stuff and he's not even part of my family. And God is gentle with him and just reaffirms. No, that's not going to happen, Abram. I'm going to give you a son. This man's not going to be your heir. In fact, Go outside and look all the stars in the sky. Count them if you can. That's how many offspring you're actually going to have. So he's reaffirming the promise to make Abram a great nation. And through Abram, all of the nations of the world will be blessed. Now, after this, after this conversation that, that God has with Abram, verse 6 is very, very important because it's quoted three times in the New Testament. It says, And Abram believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. I mean, anybody have the New American Standard Bible with them? You do? It doesn't say believe the Lord. It says he believed in the Lord, doesn't it? And I think that's the correct translation. I can show you the Hebrew if you want to later. But I think it's not that he just believed what the Lord said. He trusted the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. And he didn't just believe the promise. He believed God. And it says God counted it to him, credited it to him, reckoned it to him, if you got the old King James. He counted it to him as righteousness. So make sure you understand what you're seeing here. He, he, he didn't count Abram's faith as righteous. He counted Abram as righteous because of his faith. You see it? 
Abram, on his account, is stamped righteousness. Righteousness is credited to him. It's like an accounting term that you and I might use. Uh, Abraham's books open, Abram's books open, the account is laid bare, and righteousness is stamped on his account. So on Abram's account, because he believed the Lord, uh, because he trusted in the Lord, uh, when God gave him this promise, it says God counted Abram as righteous before him because of his faith. And this, this verse, uh, Genesis uh, 15, 6, is quoted in Romans 4 and Galatians 3 and James 2. And all the New Testament writers talk about how, talk about how this is a picture of the gospel. I mean, you can clearly see it. It's not hard, to, not hard to fathom that when you trust in the Lord, when you trust in Jesus, you are counted righteousness. You are, you are given the righteousness of Christ. You are credited with this, uh, uh, this righteousness. And so uh, what you see here is um, what you see here is salvation by faith. From the very beginning, it was salvation by faith. That's the whole argument of, of Romans 9, 10, and 11, is that it's always been salvation by faith. It's always been God's grace through faith uh, in, in Jesus Christ. Abram uh, didn't know the name Jesus Christ, but he was believing in the seed that was to come. The promised seed that God uh, promised was going to crush the head of the, of the serpent. And so what you have here is a reaffirmation of God's promise to Abram when he is afraid, when he's, uh, when he's frustrated, when he's waiting on the promise and he doesn't see it. And, you know, you, you know how you and I get when we're... We're, you know, we want it on our own time. We want it on our own schedule. You know, we want God to, you know, we want God to fulfill what we need fulfilled at the time we needed it fulfilled. And God very often doesn't work that way. Uh, and so he gives Abram grace and it says Abram believed him and you have this transaction that takes place. Abram is counted righteousness, not because Abram is so wonderful, but because of his faith. Now, his faith is going to show later on when he goes to sacrifice Isaac. That's the, that's the argument of James chapter 2, uh, that Abram uh, showed his faith and his righteousness by being willing to do this thing, being willing to act and sacrifice Isaac. But we're in Genesis chapter 15 here. Isaac's not going to be born for another you know, 19 years. And so this has nothing to do with Abram's actions or his acts or his anything. It is about his faith. He believes believed the Lord and it was counted to him. It was credited to him as a righteousness. Now, any questions, comments, cries of outrage? No? Y'all with me? Was it, was it right then that he re received righteousness or was it... I think so. I think so. I think the question was, was it right then that he received righteousness? I think it was. I think it was because it says he counted, past tense. He believed in the Lord and he... God counted it to him, Abram, as righteousness. He, he gave him a righteousness that didn't belong to him. You know, like we receive a righteousness that doesn't belong to us. I mean, I guess it does belong to us after we receive it, but it's Christ's righteousness, not our righteousness. It doesn't come from our goodness or our stuff. It comes from what Jesus did. And so uh, he was given, he was credited, credited cred, he was given <laughs> righteousness. Okay, so here we have this reaffirmation of the promise. We have Abram believing and receiving righteousness. And then this is absolutely my favorite scene in the whole, in the whole of Genesis. From, chap, from verse 7 down to 21, what you're going to see here is God is going to formalize his covenant with Abram. Uh, and it's really, it's really such a, man, it's just a, it's a beautiful gospel picture. Um, first, what he does is he repeats the promise to give him the land. He says, and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you the land to possess. He's reminding him of where he came from. You know, a lot of times it's, it's good for us when we're doubting, when we're afraid, when we're frustrated to, to remember what God's brought you th through. Remember your calling. Remember what, remember what God has called you to be and to do and what he said. He said, I, you, you remember, Abram, I'm the one, I'm the one who brought you out of, here, out of Ur of the Chaldees. I'm the one that called you. I'm the one that promised you I'm going to give you the land. And then Abram still says, we're talking about the land now, not the air. He says, but he said, oh Lord, how am I to know? 
know that I shall possess it. Now, here is not the same as before. I think here he's asking for a sign. He's asking for, give me something to show me that it's real, that, that I know that I am going to possess this land. Give me something that I can, I can, I can hold on to. You know, he's been waiting all this time and it's, it's hard to see. He's gone through one obstacle after another. The land sure hadn't been cooperating uh, with us. And, and Abram asks him, give me something to hold on to. Give, how am I going to know that I shall possess it? And God's response to this question is so awesome, but we don't understand it in our modern minds. God said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Abram, Abram understands what he means. We don't because it's a modern context. It's strange. He says, how am I going to know that I'm going to possess this land? How am I to know that your promise is going to be fulfilled of the air and of the land? And, a and God speaks to Abram and he tells them to bring these animals. And Abram knows exactly why. He's supposed to get these animals. What God is about to do is about to cut a covenant with Abram. So Abram knows, right off the bat, I'll show you how he knows in just a minute, but Abram knows that when God says, okay, you want to know that you're going to possess it? Go get me a heifer, a goat, a ram, turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Interestingly enough, these are the animals that would be routinely sacrificed in the tabernacle and the temple. But he says, go get me these animals. And what they're going to do is God is going to cut a covenant. He's going to perform a covenant ceremony with Abram to make this covenant formal. I am going to give you these things. I'm going to give you these promises that I've given. In the ancient Near East... Um, this is how covenants were made. So lots of covenants were made. Kings and vassals would make covenants with one another. They would promise you know, protection over a group of people and the vassals would, would promise loyalty to the king. And, and to make a covenant, today we would sign a contract. And that's your, your word in writing is your bond. That's how we make a covenant. That's how we make a contract. But what they did was two parties would come together and they would state the terms of the covenant. They would say, I'm going to do this. This is my part of the covenant. You're going to do this. This is your part of the covenant. And then what they would do is take animals and they would cut them in half. And they would put the two pieces on either side. And to ratify the covenant, the two parties would walk together through the pieces. And that was basically they were... They, they were um, uh, signifying a curse on themselves if they break the covenant. You can see in Jeremiah how you can see some of this in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 34, 17 through 19, uh, therefore, thus saith the Lord. He's talking about the people who have broken covenant with him. He said, you have not obeyed me by proclaiming liberty, everyone to his brother and to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim, I proclaim to you liberty to the sword. Basically, I'm going to kill y'all to pestilence and to famine, declares the Lord. I will make you a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth and the men who transgressed my covenant. See, they transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they, may, that they made before me. I will make them like the calf that they cut in two and passed between its parts. The officials of Judah, and then he names the people who, who was uh, there. The officials of Judah, officials of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf. So he's talking about a covenant that's been cut. Everybody understand that? So today we shake hands. Today we sign the contract. In this day and age, they would cut animal pieces in parts. They would declare what each party would do in the covenant to ratify the covenant. They would walk through the pieces together signifying, if I break this covenant, let me be like one of these slain animals that are cut to pieces. Everybody understand? With me? Yes. I don't know, was it? Female goat, ram. Well, it might have been a boy ram. Tur I don't know. A turtle does a female too? And a young pigeon? I don't know. She asked why they're all female. I don't, I don't know. I never thought of that. A ram is a male? Okay. See, I, I ain't grew up on a farm. I have no idea. Frank? 
But the females, they have the potential to have babies. And you're giving up the potential of children. Right? Well, that may be true. He said uh, females can have babies. Females are more valu female heifers are more valuable because that's where your stock comes from. Yeah. Maybe so. Maybe so. Um, yeah, that slipped by me. I never noticed that. Good catch. So Abram knew what he wanted him to do. Remember, he says, what will you give me that I'll know that I'll possess it? God says, Abram, get me a heifer and a ram and turtle doves. And Abram doesn't ask why. What are you doing? Instead, Abram knew exactly what he wanted to do because verse 10 says, and he brought all of these. He just went and got them. He's like, yeah. And God didn't tell him what to do with him. Abram instinctively knew. He brought him all these. He cut them in half and laid each half over against each other. Abram knew what was about to happen. God is about to ratify his covenant. He's about to cut a covenant with me. He's about to formalize his promise by making a covenant with me. He's going to come and declare his terms and then he's going to tell me what I have to do and then we're going to walk through the pieces together and that's the covenant ceremony and that's what's going to happen. So Abram knows what to do and he goes and he does what is needed to set up this covenant ceremony. He cuts the animals in half. He lays them uh, aside from each other uh, but he didn't cut the birds in half. I mean, it's a bird. He put one bird on, on either side. Uh, and when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them, drove them away. So Abram set this stuff out, and he waited. Where's God? Okay, God, I'm ready. And he waited. And he waited, and he waited. And you know what happens when there's dead animals laying out on the ground? Here come the vultures. Here come the, here come the scavengers. And he waited, and he waited, and he waited. And when the bird, he waited so long that he had to chase these birds away because they were picking at the animals. They were trying to get the animals that he had cut, you know, and he, he had cut the, uh, to the, for the ceremony. God didn't come. And I'm sure Abram's thinking, you know, well, okay, God, I've done what you told me to do. Where are you? Where are you? So he waits so long, he's expecting what's, what's supposed to happen is God is supposed to come and tell me, make his promise, make his covenant stipulation, what he's going to do, and then he's supposed to tell me what I have to do, and then we're supposed to walk through these pieces together. That's how covenants work. But that's not what happens. He waits and waits, and finally he falls asleep. He says, and the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. The reason why it was called a dreadful, a terrifying darkness uh, and great darkness that fell upon him is because God's presence is coming. God's presence is about to show up. God is about to come and he is about to give the terms of the covenant and he is about to, he's about to make this covenant with Abram. And what God does as he comes to make this covenant with Abram, as he does, all covenants start this way, they would declare the terms of the covenant. What I will do, what you must do. This is what I, a king would say, I will protect you, I will feed you, I will keep invaders from your village. And the villagers would say, we will be loyal, we will serve you, we will give you taxes. You know, that's how covenants were made. Uh, and that's what is supposed to happen here. And so God begins by telling him how he's going to give him the land. The Lord said to Abram, remember, Abram's asleep. The great darkness is there. And the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring, he's telling him you're going to have a child, your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. He's telling Abram what's going to happen. He's telling him, look, tomorrow you're not going to get the land, okay? The next day, you're not going to get the land. Your offspring, in fact, are going to be sojourners in a foreign land, and they're going to be slaves there. They're going to be servants there for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. When did this happen? What's he talking about? Talking about Egypt. Yeah, Exodus. That's right. That's right. So for 400 years, they will be slaves in a foreign land. He's telling Abram what's going to happen. He's making promises to Abram. He's explaining to Abram how he will come to possess the land. Exactly what Abram asked for. He says they'll be afflicted for 400 years, but don't worry. I'm going to bring judgment on the nation they serve. How does he do that? 
plagues. Yeah, you got it. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. How did that happen? Remember? Yeah, they just gave it. Yeah, here, take all my stuff and leave. Get out of here. You know, that happened. They come out with uh, great possessions. And so he's telling them how they, he, Abram's going to possess the land. And then he tells Abram what's going to happen to him. He says, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried in a good old age. And they, talking about the offspring, they shall come back here in the fourth generation, 400 years. Actually, they're in Egypt for 430 years, but that's the same thing. Uh, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So he tells them what's going to happen. He says, Abram, you're going to die before you get the land. But I'm going to give the land to your offspring. They're going to spend 400 years as slaves in a foreign land. Then I'm going to bring judgment. I'm going to bring them out of that land. They're going to come here. And the reason why it's going to take 400 years, you make sure you remember this. Mark this in your Bible, verse 16 right there. The reason why they spend 400 years in Egypt before they come back to conquer the land is because the iniquity, the sins of the Amorites is not yet complete. The sin of the Amorites is not yet complete. They pro he promises they will return, but it's going to take this long because basically what he's saying there is, I'm giving the Amorites in this land 400 years to repent and to turn to me. They have 400 years to repent and turn to me, and if they don't, I'm going to slaughter them. I'm going to bring Joshua and the people and I'm going to take over the land and they're going to, they're going to destroy all the nations. Well, they're supposed to destroy all the nations anyway. So whenever you hear someone say, God's just a meanie. Have you ever read Joshua and he just told them to kill all them people? How could God? God gave them 400 years to repent. And they had the testimony. They had Abram who was in the land building altars, proclaiming the name of God. They also had Melchizedek who was a priest in Salem who was a servant and a priest of the Most High God. They had the testimony of the Lord Most High. They had um, enough light to turn to him. Uh, he says, I'm going to give them 400 years and then you know, the, their sin will be full. Basically, I'm going to send Joshua and the people back and they're going to... You know, they're going to take the land. They're going to destroy the land. And that's what, uh, that's what happens. Uh, God has told Abram what he is going to do. God has given him the covenant stipulation of what God is going to do. He's told him, this is what I'm going to do for you, Abram. Your offspring, the, the son you will have, will have lots of other offspring. And there for 400 years, going to be servants in a foreign land. And then I'm going to go get them and judgment and possessions. And I'm going to bring them back here. And you're going to die in the meantime in peace at a good old age. And they're going to come back to this land. And they're going to take this land uh, by destroying the Amorites and the Perizzites and all the other ites in the, in the land uh, because their sin will be full at that time. God has basically begun this covenant ceremony by giving Abram what God has pledged himself to do. This is how you will have what I've promised you. This is how you will have the land. Uh, remember Abram's question, how do I know that I'm going to possess it? This is how. God in this covenant ceremony has given him the promise. Now what's supposed to happen now is God tell Abram what your part of the covenant is. I've told you what I'm going to do as God, as the king in this covenant situation. Now we're making a covenant. You're my servant. You're my vassal. Now I'm going to tell you what I expect of you and what you have to do in this covenant. And together we will walk through the pieces together to ratify this covenant. That is what's supposed to happen, but that's not what happens. Verse 17 it says, When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. I can tell by your face you're not as in awe as I am over that verse. I love that. When people, when people ask me, just write down a verse or something that might be meaningful, I like to write this one down. When they look it up, they're like, ah, what does that mean? This is amazing. It's, it's God showing up. God often shows up in smoke and fire. You see it through, you know, the smoke that filled the temple, the burning bush, pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, all through the Old Testament, smoke and fire, these things. God's presence shows up as a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch. 
And God all by Himself walks through the pieces. He's supposed to say, Abram, this is what you must do in order for this covenant to be ratified and for us to keep covenant with one another. But He doesn't. He doesn't give Abram any stipulations whatsoever. He doesn't. He walks through the pieces alone. Abram is given no part in this covenant other than to receive what God has promised. He's given no terms that he has to abide by. He's given no work that he has to do. He's giving he's given nothing like that. Later, you'll see the Mosaic covenant and they're given a bunch of laws, a bunch of things that they're supposed to do. But for Abram, he's given nothing. He's not even invited to walk between the pieces together because in reality, God is not. I mean, he is making a covenant covenant with Abram, but he's making a covenant by his own name. He's making a covenant by his own by his own promise. God walking through the pieces by himself signifying, I swear by my own name that I will do these things, that I will give you. This covenant that he's making with Abram is based on God and God alone. It doesn't depend on Abram at all. This is the gospel, is it not? We are today in Jesus Christ brought into this covenant with Abram. This is a this is a, a picture and a foreshadow of the covenant that we have been brought into. We're told several times in the New Testament that we in Jesus Christ are Abram's seed, Abraham's seed. That we are heirs according to the promise that was given to Abram. In Genesis chapter 3, it says Christ, Paul's telling them about the law and about the promise. And he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So that we might receive the promised spirit. Through faith, just as Abram's faith was counted to him as righteousness, our faith is counted to us as righteousness, and we become part of the covenant of Abraham. So God makes this covenant with Abraham that he will have an heir, that his, his children will be given the land, and that he would be his shield, his reward. He, he would do these things through the earth, through, through, your, through you, through your family. All of the earth would be blessed. Paul says that that is the gospel promise. And he makes this covenant, formalizing it based on nothing more than who he is. Abraham's not asked to walk through the pieces because there's nothing Abraham can add. God is promising based on his own name and his own word and his own person that he, he is promising based on who he is. Uh, and that's pretty exciting to me. I don't know if that's very exciting to y'all as much as it is for me anyway. Questions, comments? I think this is interesting for the Israelites too. They come out of Egypt and the fact that it's a smoke and fire pot and a torch, what led them through? It would be very clear that this is the same God that, yeah. that, that is guiding them now that the promise was made to Abraham. This was as much, I think, for them, for the descendants of Abraham, yeah. as it was for Abraham. Yeah, he said that uh, it was. It would have been. It was for the Israelites as well. For when they did come out of Egypt in the Exodus, in fulfillment of all these things, it was a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud that that led them. Uh, would have brought their minds right back to this to this section where God promised, based on who He is. Any other questions, comments? So whenever I, whenever I have taught this section before, somebody always asks me, y'all haven't asked me, but I'm going to tell you anyway, about the land. What about the land? God promised them he would have the land. He told them that they would come out of the land. He, he gave them the land. He gave them the land during Joshua's time. Joshua and the people came and they conquered the land. And I, I, I put up a couple of verses. Well, let me read the rest of this chapter first. It says, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. So it declares it. That the smoking pot and the torch going through the pieces, that was the formalizing of the covenant. Abram, he made a covenant with Abram saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the, all the rest of themites, <laughs> all, all them people that live in the land. 
I'm giving this land to you. And whenever I teach this, all, people always ask, what about the land? You know, the, they still don't have the land. Well, no, but they were given the land. They were given the land in Joshua's day. And I can prove it because in Joshua chapter 21, verse 43, this is the end of Joshua. This is after they've conquered all the land. They didn't, they didn't do what God told them to do and dispatch with all the people as they were supposed to. But they did conquer the land. This is Joshua giving a final speech to his people, 21 and 23. He says, thus the Lord gave to Israel, uh, this is narrated, thus the Lord gave to Israel, Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers. You see it? It's told us that right there. He gave them all the land that he swore to give to their fathers and they took possession of it and they settled there and the Lord gave them rest on every side just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. I don't know how much clearer he could say it than that. And then in the last chapter, chapter 23 of Joshua, it says, this is Joshua's speech before he's uh, uh, before the end of the book. It says, and now I'm about to go to the way of all the earth. He's about to die. And you know, in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. But just as the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you. If you trespass the covenant of the Lord your God, talking about the Mosaic covenant here, which he commanded you and go and serve other gods and bow down to them. So what you see here in the end of, the jo uh, end of Joshua is that they were given the land. Everything that God said to Abram in the covenant that he made with Abram came to pass. They were slaves in a foreign land for 430 years. They were brought out under the judgment of God as he judged Egypt. And they were brought out with great possessions. They did return to the land. They did conquer the land. They were given all, the, all that God had promised them that they would have. And then later, as the story progresses, you know, they went and served other gods and God you know, scattered them uh, through, through Babylon, Assyria, those kind of things as we move on into Scripture. But what you see here is really, for me, I guess, it's, it's a connection from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's, it's a continuation of the story of God's salvation by grace through faith. Um, a lot of times we, we, we put a split right between the Old Testament and the New Testament as if that's one side of the coin and we don't have to worry about that anymore and that was past and that don't have anything to do with us today and the New Testament is all... No, no, this is, this is the story of salvation by grace through faith from the beginning all the way to the end. Um, now, he gave, there was reasons why he gave the Mosaic Covenant and all that, and we, we'll talk about that when we get to it. But um, you, you have to understand that the Abrahamic Covenant, if that's what you want to call it, that is the beginning, the foreshadow, uh, the definite um, signing of a contract, if you will, of God giving salvation to the world. By grace through faith. Because one of the prob promises that he made, Abram, was not just for Abram's uh, offspring to, to, um, to have the land. But if you remember, and we'll see this promise again come up in the next few chapters. He said, through you, all the world will be blessed. All the nations, all those nations who are not Israel will be blessed through you. And we know that that happens through the great, 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 great grandson of Abram who is Jesus Christ. Questions, comments? I have a question. Okay. It said, if, if you transgress God's command, mm -hmm. which the United States is doing, is that why we're receiving judgment? <laughs> Yeah, we can talk about that. Let's finish Genesis and then we'll talk about we'll talk about that. <laughs> Is there any other questions about Genesis and Abraham before we turn the cameras off? No? All right. Well, let's pray together and we will commence again next week. 
Father, we love you. We thank you today for who you are. We thank you for your mercy. God, we thank you for your covenant. We thank you for um, the promise that you have made all by yourself, God. There was no stipulation of work, no stipulation of goodness or, or faithfulness or anything placed upon Abram. Uh, God, you, you uh, promised uh, salvation for him. You promised land. You promised the seed would come and that all nations would be blessed through him. And you ratified that, that covenant. Covenant, you signed that contract uh, by your own name, God, and by your own person because of who you are. And God, we thank you that in Jesus Christ, we are brought into that covenant. We are brought into uh, having righteousness credited to our account when we trust in you as Abraham did. Lord, we, we thank you so much that no matter what happens in this world, uh, our mission hadn't changed. Our God hadn't changed. The promises that we have in you have not changed. Our gospel hasn't changed, God. And uh, Lord, the promises that we have uh, in the New Testament promises that we see over and over again for those who are in Christ. Those are just as binding as the one that you gave Abram. And we can trust in those promises no matter what we see in the world, no matter what we see going on in our own life. Father, we ask that you would give us um, give us a heart that desires to be faithful to you and desires to walk in your way. For we know that uh, when you save somebody, when you give them righteousness, you don't just stamp it on their forehead. You change their heart to love you and to serve you and to follow after you, God. So, Lord, we just, we just pray that you would grow us in that heart and that you would watch over us for good. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.